field. Quick introduction from my end. My name is Rajiv Jairaman. I'm the founder and CEO of Nolscape. Um, I've been fortunate to be a TEDx speaker. I've delivered uh, keynote speeches at various uh, conferences worldwide. I'm the author of uh, Clearing the Digital Blur. I'm deeply passionate about technology, learning, and design. And that uh, helps me design new age learning experiences for leaders and employees worldwide. And it's my pleasure to uh, introduce you to Benny Ramos. Uh, he's based out of uh, Canada. He's a solution expert for business and leadership training. He's active in uh, North America and APAC. So immense experience working with large organizations across the world. He acts as the voice of uh, the customer and he has led uh, customer success teams in uh, North America for Skillsoft. And prior to Skillsoft, he led a learning function for a large Canadian telecom organization. Welcome to the webinar, uh, Benny, and welcome to all of you. Uh, thanks for being here uh, for this very important uh, webinar addressing a very key critical topic. So on this occasion, I'm uh, delighted to announce a strategic partnership between Nolscape and Skillsoft. This is a very important milestone for uh, Nolscape as an organization. So with this uh, partnership, the world's best simulations from Nolscape meets one of the world's largest e-learning libraries from Skillsoft to solve some of the critical talent challenges that organizations face around the world. I'm very excited about this uh, strategic partnership. Now, you might be asking this question, why is this a compelling combination? There are a few reasons why this uh, partnership is critical for this time and age. Let me take you through a story. This is how the world was looking in 2008. You'd recall Hillary Clinton was running for presidentship in the US and this is how her supporters were uh, thronging around her, you know, trying to shake hands with her, taking uh, pictures with her, taking autographs and so on. This was the year 2008. Let's fast forward to 2016. This is how the world became. You would notice that the biggest difference between these two pictures and in a span of about eight years is that Mobile phones became commonplace. Broadband got you know, great penetration uh, across many countries in the world. And you'd recall Time Magazine uh, usually has a person of the year. And somewhere around the 2010 timeframe, I believe, they had a picture of you that is all of us as people being the Time person of the year. So that's how the tilt has happened. Uh, the shift has happened towards um, all of us individuals and with these devices, we are able to accomplish a lot more than ever before. That is a fundamental shift that's happening in the world around us. Now, applying it to the learning context, our learners have changed as well. So as we are designing new experiences for our learners, one thing we need to bear in mind is in the last few years, there has been a dramatic um, a change in the demographic of the learner, right? And this is a funny image where this individual is asking for gifts from Santa Claus and sends an uh, Amazon URL, right? That's how uh, learners have changed. We deal with multiple generations working uh, shoulder to shoulder in today's context, and we need to have a very different approach to learning. And we need to acknowledge that modern learners today are distracted. There are too many electronic impulses we have around us. We are overwhelmed and uh, talk about being overwhelmed in 2020, we are impatient, we want to get uh, instant gratification uh, for everything that we want, press a button and we need um, to get things done. We are untethered and we are social, right? And, and these are some major trends that have happened uh, in the last few years. And we need to account for this in any learning program that we create for the organization. Now you would uh, agree with me when I say this, there are some fundamental challenges in the way learning is architected in today's context, right? And uh, learning is super critical uh, with all these transformative changes that are happening around us. If we don't get this right, there is a risk of being irrelevant, right? You might be familiar with the statistic, more than 52% of the companies on the Fortune 500 list have disappeared from that list since the year 2000, mainly because of the rapid changes that have happened and learning has not unfortunately kept pace with it, right? So then what are the key challenges? Number one, 
today for most of us learning is accidental not intentional learning is not structured and deep it is very shallow and surface level which gives us an illusion of knowledge and uh, and skill and there's too much focus on learning and knowledge acquisition with very little unlearning and behavioral change and without behavioral change actual business impact does not happen so these are some key challenges just expanding on this this is the university of accidental learning right today most of us learn through whatsapp university where ignorance is bliss right uh, we go by the forwards that we get we get an illusion of knowing everything that's happening around us but all of that is just accidental learning right we happen to learn what's coming our way we are not being intentional about it now the next point on uh, deep versus shallow learning this is a fundamental problem we as learners today we are um you know engaging in very shallow learning that gives us this illusion of learning and mastery in fact for behavioral change to happen for continuous learning to be effective we require deeper methodologies right and it is not just the content we need multiple things to come together for um you know actual impact to happen so content is obviously one element beyond that we need the right channels to be deployed by channels i mean different modes of learning it could be in classroom it could be live virtual it could be uh, self paced mobile format and so on and then context is essentially what is the relevance of this content content to the learner that needs to be established there needs to be a proper curriculum right which assesses uh, the current state of the learner creates a pathway and then there is a post assessment and there's a pre and post uh, needle movement and so on and learning is a, a social endeavor so are there communities involved and how exactly are learners consuming this content and uh, demonstrating some actual impact so all the six c's as we call it are very important but when you think about how learning happens in today's context probably we are taking off uh, two of these c's three c's uh, two or three of these three c's but not all six so we need to have a holistic approach to learning so uh, so that's about uh, deep and shallow learning and the other part i spoke about is there's too much knowledge acquisition but very little unlearning and relearning happening right and this is one of my favorite quotes to experience is to learn everything else is just information so this is something that uh, we live by at nol scale and and i can speak about skillsoft as well as an organization they are wonderful when it comes to creating um, a fantastic learning experience so to me um, behavioral change actual business impact is a function of habit loops right are we able to create effective habit loops in our learners right and uh, this is something you must all be familiar with the habit loop is essentially the cue uh, the trigger that gets you into a routine you do the act and then you get rewarded in the end right and because of the reward you are looking forward to the cue once more the next time it happens you you automatically get into the routine so that's how habits work now if you think about in the learning context our organizations really building learning cultures by building these habit loops uh, from my experience not not enough right so we're not doing enough so how do you build this obviously there is an element of education right and we need to create the right cues through this we need to create the right experience and the right exposure for the habit loop to be created and sustained over a period of time now talking about um, the experience part right which is where uh, nolscape has uh, done a lot of innovative work in the last few years uh, there's a library and a portfolio of uh, simulation courses we have created around leadership and future skills right and uh, these simulations are immersive uh, learning content uh, elements where you uh, play the role of a decision maker there's a, a virtual case study or a storyline you take decisions and right at the end of this experience you are able to see uh the analytics the report that comes out uh right so that's uh you know great from a safe learning perspective learning unlearning behavior change reflection so that's wonderful as a as a format a format learning by doing is one of the most effective ways to build uh, new skills so those are essentially some of the titles that we have in the portfolio but what is exciting with this um uh, nolscape skillsoft combination is that not only is the learning engaging we are also able to create deep talent intelligence for the organization great learning for the learner talent intelligence for the organization so it's this dual value proposition that makes it extremely compelling 
Now I'd like to invite uh, Benny to talk about uh, what Skillsoft has been up to when it comes to leadership development and digital transformation. Over to you, uh, Benny. Sure. Thank you so much, Rajiv. And and again, in terms of that partnership, before we we go forward, again, the, the partnership is a great collaboration, especially with uh, someone like Rajiv, who's who's written. Uh, you know, books around the digital transformation uh, that can guide organizations, I think there's a great partnership there. there. So when we think our, of our content solutions, one of the things you're going to know very well to our solution, and I'll, I'll talk to this in just a moment, but the idea that we have uh, really had brain science behind the solution to ensure that our, our content is engaging and is effective. The other piece is in and around digital transformation, of course, and um, maybe what we can talk to is, is how it's effective. So if we, we play a video here, we have an, uh, a experiment that we did for around 24 months. And uh, if we start the video, what we're gonna see is that uh, we partnered with the Massachusetts Inst Institute of Technology, MIT, at the McGovern Institute. And what uh, ended up happening there is we were able to have Accenture employees with, uh, in the MIT labs, uh, going through an fMRI and EEG machine while they were taking learning. So if, uh, essentially, if we were to see, uh, there we go. If we were to see what's happening here is this is an Accenture employee. And uh, with fMRI, we were actually able to see which parts of the brain were being activated and with the EEG, how strong that stimulation was. So when we think of engagement and uh, really uh, interest, interest is not does the person like it or not, it's where the, was their brain being activated and how strong was that activation? And we learned many things, including rate of speech that was effective, the number of colors and so on. And uh, over this two year time frame, we found that especially with um, business and leadership uh, solutions, scenario-based video, showing people what good, good looks like, not just telling people what good looks like with experts was going to be very effective. And what that has uh, fundly, fundamentally led to is last November, all our leadership solutions, which were originally vetted through Wharton Business School, uh, is now created, co-created and co-curated with MIT Sloan Management Review. So this is something that uh, hopefully you have the confidence that not only are we dealing with an organization uh, that is uh, current, but also has a great history in uh, technology and leadership development. So thank you so much. Thank you, Benny. That was uh, fascinating indeed. Uh, so the deep research that uh, Skillsoft stands for, you know, resonates with the kind of uh, values that we have when we uh, build our own products, uh, simulations, uh, that are based on deep science and frameworks and uh, methodologies. So um, yeah, once again, I'm very excited about this partnership. So moving on to uh, certain questions that uh, we want to address as part of this uh, webinar, and I'm sure these are top of the mind issues for, uh, for most of us today. Uh, I'd like to pick uh, on uh, Benny's brains here for uh, these questions. What does the term skill force bring to your mind? And what would that mean uh, to your organization and industry? Let's. Uh, Hear it from Benny in terms of uh, what he's, um, you know, seeing and 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 hearing from the uh, different organizations that he's working with. Sure. Thank you so much. So when we decades, because we would have people in uh, many roles that was kind of a career over their lifetime, uh, perhaps homogenous teams, and really this idea that it was skilled. Uh, that you learned at the beginning of your career. And once you learned that skill, it was just effort that would take you through the rest of your career. Of course, that's changed very much. The changing nature of work is, is very different. We are now leading teams that are more um, mission-based teams. They're gonna be probably uh, very dispersed now, especially with digital transformation. As you know, that has been changing. Uh, the idea that they are really diverse teams. So as a leader, you might have been the best of someone making something, and that way you became the leader of that team making that one thing. Now the teams have marketing, and they have HR, and they have all sorts of different functions that are cross-functional. So you need to know many things, not just one thing. And, and really this whole idea of di around digital transformation, which uh, has been in the spotlight recently because of COVID, where technology that was being used for 
effectiveness and productivity with AI machine learning and so on is now being used for safety. It's being used for business continuity. Um, Accenture would say that there has really been spent in the last three to five months. So uh, this idea of the skills force is really focusing on the idea that you need to upskill, you need to reskill, you need to uh, keep in mind that the World Economic Forum has indicated one in six jobs or roles that are primarily just labor-based will, will be essentially eliminated. So the only way that you can be fully employed and employed in the future is really to uh, upskill, reskill, skill and key is going to be a, a very big part of leadership go, go forward. It's not something that you can split off from leadership. So I, I'm going to ask R Rajiv, what, what's your reaction to, to that answer? Yeah, so um, I think you're bringing in a very interesting perspective, uh, Benny. So a lot of uh, things have changed in uh, today's workplace, right? So when I uh, look at certain research reports, what I understand is that you know, if you look at the industrial era, the, the whole transformation that happened around that time in the 1800s uh, for jobs to move from the farm to the factory, it took about 90 years, uh, right? For majority of these jobs to shift over. And then from the factory to the service jobs that we see today, that transformation took about uh, 45 years, uh, right? And then now when you look at uh, digital transformation, and this is not the first time you're seeing a a massive transformation, right? So this is probably the fourth revolution that uh, that's going on right now. Uh, but this one is not going to last for 90 years, not for 45. At best, it's going to last for about 10 years. And COVID um, has actually accelerated this, right? And even the most traditional organizations are, um, you know, working from home for the first time, uh, getting accustomed to virtual processes. They're finding that they don't have the right skill set uh, for the future. So to me, the term skill force is um, very, very pertinent today. And as I mentioned earlier, companies are getting disrupted. 52% of companies on the Fortune 500 list becoming redundant. All of this boils down to a few things. One, talent readiness. Second mm -hmm. is um, acceleration. How fast can we do this, right, at scale? Because we don't have the luxury of time. We don't have 90 years. We don't have 45 years. And the time is right now, if not yesterday, to get this done. So there's a sense of urgency. And there is also a sense of doing this at scale, right? And how do you do this at scale? So these are two things I've seen organizations uh, grapple with and, um, and some of them are very successful. And where I see them being successful is where they take a progressive view towards learning and to your point, upskilling and reskilling. They make that um, you know, front and center in uh, their scheme of things. Absolutely. I think I would say that in time, the pandemic uh, and the changes that are happening today, it's not temporal, it's going to continue. The uh, CLO of TD Bank had indicated that um, the number of careers that people can expect over the next, uh, their lifetime is now in the range of 27 to 30 because roles are changing, jobs are changing. And in fact, one of the most uh, prevalent uh, jobs in, in research that has surged to the top of, of government uh, when we you think of a day to six years ago, and now it's very, very prevalent, and it's a high paying, high paying job. The the other aspect that I would say is is that uh, from the standpoint of of uh, leadership again, um, Harold Yarkey, who uh, uh, is part of the Internet Time Alliance with Jay Cross, Clark Quinn, um, those types of folks, uh, he talked about this idea of. Um, hierarchy to hierarchy. So again, yeah. the idea that we had command and control, probably co-located co uh, or anymore. The, the, the uh, network, the hierarchy that leaders have to lead is not just people to people, but people to machines and machine to machine. So it's they're, they're responsible for the output of the whole organization, including those technology, not just the people. So um, very interesting. Yes, indeed. Uh, so, in fact, when I look at the role of learning and development in all of this, uh, traditionally, LND has thought about capabilities of people and the confidence of people on the job, and that's what the primary roles are. And to your point of hierarchy, uh, today, LND professionals also have to think about the connectedness, right? So, it's uh, the three C's the capabilities, the confidence, as well as the connectedness. So, that's uh, something new that has come into 
the LND fold. Uh, so we need to start thinking about what does it mean to be working alongside with a bot? Um, what does it mean to be working in a network of sorts? Uh, think about gig economy, right? So those are also people that you're leveraging uh, to get your stuff done. So what does learning mean for that workforce, right? So it is an expanding world and it is uh, definitely something new that's uh, come to the table. So that's interesting. I'm going to move on to the next one. So uh, given the speed of change that digital transformation has brought in and the world has undergone recently, what approach should companies take to ensure their teams have the skills they need? Um, so, and, and the context to this, Benny, is when I um, talk to a lot of organizations, they get the point that, uh, you know, learning is critical, capability building has to be accelerated, but um, the problem is around where should I start? Right. What skills Absolutely. do I need? Yeah. So the, I, I do know that the, the issue is not that uh, in many organizations, it's not that they are the employees or the team members are not getting training. It's around the focus of that training. So last year we did a, a, a uh, research with Vance and Bourne and, and uh, throughout Asia, a uh, number of countries, uh, whether it be Malaysia, Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, the whole region overall, and what was found is around seven of 10 employees were very concerned about their future employability, which many of us should be, or full employability. The second piece though was almost consistent that seven in 10 thought, even though they were getting training, they were not getting training for their future employability. So they thought their employers could do more. Uh, it's again, not just about today, but tomorrow. So investing, investing in the future. And I, when we think about the approach that organizations sh should take, um, probably three things. One is acknowledge that uh, the time that people have to learn, making sure the systems that they have in place and the, the uh, platforms that are there are enabling them to learn. So the classroom isn't going to do it. Um, we know that um, Josh Burson, who, who coined the term e-learning, or he says he, he created the term e-learning uh, a number of years ago, uh, he asked uh, an audience in, in a conference in Las Vegas, e-learn, he asked them what percentage of work was at or near an internet connected device. Um, this is higher than, than uh, now than it was back then, but back then it was about 83%. The loaded question is what percentage of modern work is at or near the classroom? It's a very, very small percentage. So if you are only doing classroom training and you're only doing events, uh, you're not really going to ensure that your teams have the skills they need when they need it. So uh, thinking of technology, scalable, consistent mes messaging, uh, and really in terms of cost, we, we can show that it's, it's very cost effective. I think the only other thing that we, we uh, think about when you look at Josh Burson and, and the distracted learner, and really uh, the, the he had actually talked in 2018 about the fact that only you know around 21 to 25 minutes a week are, are available for a learner to actually, actually uh, you know, get the time and schedule themselves in to learn because work gets in the way. We have meetings, we have priorities, we have, now we have families, we're all, we're all at home. Um, one of the most uh, read uh, M MIT Sloan Management Review articles in the last 60 days is by Linda Gratton, how to work at home with kids. And we're all doing this, this right now. So we have these distracted learners and it's not just work that's distracting them, it's social media, it's entertainment and do we have learning that can compete with Facebook and YouTube and everything that they find engaging? So you have to be as engaging as that or you're not gonna have the mind share of the learner. So I'm, I'm gonna stop there and, and see if uh, your response to that, Richard. Yeah, Benny, that, those are wonderful points uh, once again. So uh, the way we approach uh, this and when that specific questions come, uh, question comes our way in terms of, hey, where do we start? Uh, what should be our approach? Um, the uh, typical answer to that is, you know, we look at uh, digital transformation specifically from uh, a maturity curve perspective. There are four distinct steps that you could take. Number one is knowing digital, right? So do you even know what's going on around you, right? So which is all about awareness and, and this whole outside in mindset, right? Because uh, disruption is real. Um, there are non-traditional competitors coming to the marketplace and disrupting organizations. So are you even aware of what's going on out there? So that's knowing digital, that's step number one. From knowing digital, you graduate into doing digital, uh, essentially where you start to embrace a few methodologies. The, 
you know, where you start to embed some uh, digital ways of working in your, uh, in your regular work. And then becoming digital is a third one where you're making rapid strides, not just from uh, the work perspective, then you start thinking in terms of what does leadership uh, look like in the digital world? What does culture look like in the digital world? And, um, and what, what do uh, mindsets, um, you, you know, what does that look like? So that's becoming digital. And then finally being digital where this becomes part of your DNA, right? So those are four distinct steps. When you talk to organizations, you can clearly tell where they are on the spectrum. Some of them are in the knowing digital stage and others are already in the, in the being digital, they are digital natives, right? So obviously, uh, depending on wh where they are, the approach is slightly different in terms of uh, awareness to application, to embedding this in your work culture. So that's how we basically advise our uh, client organizations to pick the right approach that works for them, right? Mm. Otherwise, there's a danger that, uh, you know, there's content out there, but then, um, and, and to your point, Benny, also is that training is happening right now, but it is not the right kind of training uh, being delivered at the right time for them, right? So, which is very important, I believe, um, in today's context. Perfect. Now, I think one last comment to run that is again, digital transformation, as, as you indicated, depending on the maturity of the organization, there is the capital DT, which would be you know AI, machine learning, blockchain, all those big technologies, and how can our organization incorporate those for the customer experience? But even yeah. on a smaller scale, I think there's just a, a, an an acknowledgement that we should have this leader should or every learner should know how to in these days make a video they should know how to write for the web because people look from the top uh, down and they all should you know even something like search engine op optimization people search for your yeah. your content how, how can we uh, make make that come to life so uh, again it's it's a good scale to to, to work with Absolutely. And, and uh, there are multiple other things that we notice as well. Sometimes uh, the question is around alignment within the organization, uh, right? So they see the need for digital, but they define it very differently. And so they're not able to move forward because internally they are not aligned. Uh, so, you know, some sort of a unifying framework, and that's what we've tried to do at Nullscape through Digital Blur. It's a unifying framework, uh, which sort of gives a lens for the organization to look at the world around them. And that sort of aligns uh, the entire organization to a common um, language, common framework that takes them forward. So that's alignment, that's step number one. Second is readiness. Um, so once they are aligned, you know, are, are they ready to move ahead? And what's the current state of affairs? And, and third is the mastery part, right? And how do we take people from point A to point B? And it has to be a structured journey, which involves unlearning as much mm -hmm. as uh, relearning. So th th that element has to be carefully constructed. So that's uh, been our uh, experience with the approach. And I'm going to move on to the next question, which is an interesting one as well. How should organizations be uh, shaping and supporting the skill force of the future? And where should they be spending their energies right now? Uh, so from, from the voice of the learner perspective, Benny, what are learners wanting? Oftentimes, we do see this problem that the organization wants to head in a particular direction, but uh, perhaps sometimes the learners um, have a different learning need. Um, sure. so where should organizations be spending their energies and how, how to go about doing this? So, uh, so maybe three quick points. Uh, first is from, from today, very, very, very current uh, data that we have. Um, even though learners are distracted and there's many things that, that are currently happening, the utilization of our actual learning content from Skillsoft is up from the beginning of this year um, over last year by over 350%. And uh, the reason for this is, again, the ability or the acknowledgement that individuals believe that they uh, need to be upskilling, reskilling, and being fully employed. And in particular, the content focuses have been in certifications. Why are those types of certifications? And these are both soft and power skills when you think of um, project management and uh, business analysis and also leadership and so on. It's because those are the current currency uh, that they believe that their, their careers will, will take. The second is, uh, it seems counterintuitive, but what we're seeing from technological organizations is a focus on business and leadership. And what we're seeing on business organizations is somewhat a focus on technology. Why? Because many of the organizations are blending and they want to collaborate. 
Um, but uh, overall, when you, when you think of the challenges that, that every organization is going to, um, leadership is that overarching overarching umbrella because of uh, COVID, of course, and because of, of the requirements, perhaps distance, we have um, a, a uh, morale, perhaps, issue or an engagement issue that organizations are dealing with. And, and then lastly, in terms of, of shaping a, the, the future, again, you've already used the word in an alignment, focusing the alignment in to the organizational goals and, and uh, the organizations that we've been great investments in technology, which is, is something that they should be doing to, in the name of, again, safety and business continuity. But you cannot leverage those investments unless you invest the people who are going to be using those technologies. And even if you have the data, someone has to be able to analyze and interpret that data to create solutions and or a better customer experience. So um, education is going to be very, very important when you think about that alignment that, that you're going to be spending your energy on. Absolutely, great points, Benny. I, I subscribe to whatever you mentioned just now. Uh, so from our experience, what we've seen is, um, you know, in the current context, uh, we, we see a lot of CFOs signing checks for anything that has the word AI in it. Automation is obviously uh, the flavor of the month. Uh, but uh, when, when a similar uh, proposal comes uh, towards, you know, reskilling employees, it, it goes through multiple filters. But the ultimate reality here is that um, it is an and, it is not either or. Oftentimes we talk about automation a lot, but augmentation is um, is very important as well, where the human is coupled with the machine, and that combination, uh, you know, delivers far greater results compared to just uh, the plain vanilla um, automation scenario. So both automation and augmentation have to be looked at uh, together, uh, right? So from that perspective, I, I completely agree with what you're saying. We've seen uh, traditional organizations trying to become more digital. Right, and they're spending on digital skills, both from a technology standpoint and methodologies uh, that support digital, like for example, uh, design thinking, uh, right? So uh, today no conversation around uh, customer experience is complete without um, a conversation around design thinking, right? Is that methodology well-rooted within the organization? That is a key question to be asked. Second um, uh, key thing that we are noticing is the whole idea of agility, right? So more traditional organizations Absolutely. want to become more agile. So that's a foundational capability um, in the digital world. So we're seeing a lot of these traditional organizations spending um, their energies on uh, making their workforce or skill force more agile. The third element where we're seeing a lot of traction is around uh, database decision making. So today, um, you know, automation gives and sensor-based uh, computing, it gives, gives rise to a lot of data. They say, 90% of world's information was created in the last two years. And this is from an IBM report from 2013. I'm not even mm. sure that data point is uh, relevant today. I'm sure it's um, it's not two years, it's a lot lesser. So in that context, are people able to take meaningful decisions looking at data? So database decision-making is a foundational element when it comes to uh, digital transformation. And the fourth more uh, most important thing is the whole uh, paradigm of what an organization is, that is also getting questioned, right? Uh, to your point, Benny, you, you spoke about the command and control, the more pyramid traditional organizational structures that's giving way to a more uh, of a networked uh, organization. And this network could be internal and it could be external as well, right? And one of the key things that we are noticing in our research is that uh, companies are not really uh, collaborating well enough, right? Because Absolutely. when they are looking at their customers, they need to get a single view of the customer to be able to do anything meaningful through AI or ML. They need to have all this data in one place, but that's not how they are wired internally, right? Um, and so that gives rise to a lot of friction. And so inter-functional, inter-departmental collaboration uh, is missing in many organizations. So that's a key capability to be built. And looking at the external world, think about um, the new age companies that act like platforms for them, the entire world is their network, right? It is not just what's happening inside, but the outside is also um, part of their ecosystem. And so there, uh, they are able to leverage those resources, be it human capital or physical capital. Uh, they are able to um, leverage all of that. And the ability to do that is sorely missing in many traditional organizations. So we are seeing this ecosystem mindset, data mindset, design mindset, and agile mindset. These are four things that we uh, focus on. So that's what traditional organizations are doing. 
Whereas on the other hand, um, digital native companies, they have figured it out, right? They are, um, you know, technology natives, they are digital natives. Uh, they get the idea of the ecosystem, they get the idea of uh, design and data and so on. But for them, culture becomes an important issue. You see most of uh, digital native companies where they fail is perhaps on the, the culture side and the leadership side, right? Uh, so I, I completely agree with your point of view that while on the one hand, companies are trying to go more towards the digital side. On the other, digital native companies are building their leadership and uh, leadership skills and the overall culture of the organization. No, it's uh, great, great observations. And, and again, we're, we're talking about uh, perhaps uh, coming back to the culture and, and back to your idea where we have, again, leadership and the digital transformation. If you are able to have a digital transformation, a common language across the organization, that collaboration will be much deeper. And, and back to again, the, the driving, um, driving consistent leadership and messaging throughout the organization. You know, a couple of, of interesting ones that you're, you're probably very well aware of. Uh, in in uh, 2018, the CEO of Walmart, again one of the largest retailers in the world, had indicated that they are no longer uh, a retail organization; they're a technology organization. Absolutely. And, and they had a, um, with their Walmart Foundation, um, were, were trying to drive education, especially in digital technologies. And secondly, a, a, a kind of a regional one in, in my my part of the world. Um, there's a an organization called Domino's Pizza. Uh, that was uh, written about in a, in a book called Return on Courage. And one of the biggest things that they did was they used technology and they are again, a food company that yep. declared themselves, not, not a food company, but they declared themselves a, a digital entertainment company because they, they acknowledged people don't order their food because they think it's good. They order their food because they think it's convenient. And that's why they use technology to make it convenient. And the, the interesting fact, the punchline at the end of this book is the fact that if you would have put $100 in Tesla at the same time you put $100 into a Domino's pizza, the value in the stock is almost the same, which surprised me because it's not so high profile. Um, but again, leveraging digital transformation, uh, it, it was, was very, very effective for this large organization. Yeah, that's a brilliant point and, and uh, so rightly put, uh, Benny, because the way I see this and I talk about this in my book, Clearing the Digital Blur as well, it's really a contest um, to see, you know, how soon can a traditional organization become digital and how fast can these digital native organizations go mainstream, uh, right? So be it Tesla versus Ford or GM, and GM has made rapid slides, uh, strides when it comes to digital. Uh, similarly, a traditional bank in India, like um, you know, State Bank of India, versus a digital native organization like uh, PTM, right? Who's going to become mainstream and who's going to become digital first? Right? That's uh, essentially how the the battle is uh, stacked up in the in the digital world. So that's a great point. So now, um, moving on to the last question, what constraints? So I think by now we've established that organizations do see the need to um, you know rapidly upskill and reskill their talent. Um, sometimes they struggle with the starting point and those that have made up their mind, they've figured out um, what needs to be done. They do hit some constraints. They do hit some roadblocks. So what constraints and concerns do you have as, um, you know, as you look at, uh, you know, companies around you and you talk to leaders, what, what concerns do they have about the future of talent development? Sure. Um, I think, Today, again, this, this is a very current view, but uh, back to the idea of winning morale and engagement and, and uh, sustainability. Uh, when we think of, of uh, leadership overall and the value and the ability to, to um, you know, make these better, uh, I think that it's important that uh, the idea of democratizing leadership development is going to be uh, something where we think of leadership development is business continuity for a number of reasons. Number one, of course, with, with COVID or any other, you know, um, sort of pandemic, the, the people that are probably most susceptible are, are the more mature workers in your organization. And many times these are the leaders. So it, people can leave at any time, but how, having that, you know, talent bench strength is, is going to be, you know, quite important. A, a person by the name of Mitch Joel actually had indicated that, um, uh, over a couple of years ago, the number of, of impressions a leader would have, an impression is a phone call 
a notification, an email, a text that they had to react to was around 70 per day. And today it's around 110 per day. And um, those can be roadblocks if you only have people that are not enabled and don't have that decision-making power. So if you have a distributed decision-making leadership, you can be much more agile, much, much more customer effective. And again, when it comes to issues and business continuity, um, when you think of, of uh, the, the uh, demographics, um, what was McKinsey had actually indicated that by next year, leaders that are uh, 55 to 65 is going to increase by 4.6% and uh, uh, 65 and over is actually 2.6%. So all those people will have to be replaced in the future. So again, coming back to your capabilities, I think the, the, these, are, these are some of the constraints we have to be aware of and we want to address them. And, and, and the last thing I, was ju I just wanna say is in terms of um, our ability to, to engage individuals and engagement, we know from organizations like Aon Hewitt that engaged organizations have 3% uh, less absenteeism, 10 to 12% more productivity and something called salary elasticity. So if people love where they're working, to draw them away to another organization might take up to 14% more salary to draw them away. And when Aon Hewitt talked about the two biggest um, engagement drivers, number one was work-life balance, and number two was career development or learning and development. This was supported by Aberdeen Group, and number one, they said, was performance management. My leader just telling me where I am and with respect to my performance. And number two was career development and learning and development. It's so important for people today to remain uh, skilled and know that they have confidence that they're going to be fully employed, that learning development is such a big driver. So all of us in this call who are looking about, about learning solutions, um, I think we have a very important role in engaging our organizations and keeping them productive. So I'll turn it back to you, Rajiv, to, for your comments. Yeah, great points, Benny, once again. So I, I um, completely see the value of learning engagement, right? So while uh, there's a lot of content out there, think about TED.com or YouTube or mm. um, the plethora of sources that we have uh, around us, right? Uh, but perhaps what is missing is uh, essentially the learning engagement, which Skillsoft has mastered over a period of time. Really glad to see the engagement levels going up 350%. Uh, we are seeing something similar at Nallscape uh, post-COVID where the engagement levels are really, really high, right? And, and so that's, I think, an important one. Uh, just having the content is not uh, important, is not enough. The six Cs I spoke about, uh, we need to have a holistic view towards uh, learning and development. So I think that's probably the first constraint in terms of um, having a holistic approach and one needs to invest time and energy to get that done. Uh, and the other big uh, constraint I see is the mindset. Right, uh, many organizations uh, even today look at digital and transformation as a fad. Um, they think it's going to go away, um, completely disregarding what uh, um, you know statistics have to tell us. You know the 52% uh, statistic that I spoke about on the Fortune 500 list, and, and the fact that Amazon and Google and um, Facebook and uh, all of these organizations are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. They are now trending in the trillion dollar mark. Right, so that's real. Disruption is real. Uh, but somewhere the mindsets have not kept pace with it. That is definitely a constraint. And that's a need we get uh, quite often from organizations. Can we do something about leadership mindsets? And of course, the cultural aspect. These are deep-rooted industrial cultures we have uh, developed over a period of time. How to unlearn and relearn all of this, I think that's a massive concern uh, for organizations as well. And uh, from a learning methodology standpoint, um, one of the things that we hear uh, very often is organizations, uh, you know, want to see some kind of a return on their investment. So as an organization, what we have done at Nallscape is it's not just great learning experience that's important, that's great from a learner standpoint, but what the organization really needs is talent intelligence. They need to know uh, for, uh, you know, critical competencies they are trying to build, where is the organization? Where are we in terms of red, amber, green? What do I need to do next, right? So that's something that um, currently is a constraint uh, because, uh, learning stops at just creating uh, capabilities and perhaps confidence, but the analytics part, the benchmarking, uh, those elements are uh, perhaps not available and which uh, comes as a roadblock for people to confidently spend on, um, on, on learning. Uh, that's something we are doing uh, as an organization. And as I mentioned earlier, the other big constraint is uh, the inter, 
BU collaboration, right? That's uh, sorely missing. Uh, and because of that, organizations are unable to take a big picture view of what's going on around them. So, and from a, a future of talent development perspective, I completely um, you know, agree with your point once again, in terms of the methodology becoming more do it yourself, uh, because this needs to happen at scale. It needs to happen in an accelerated fashion. Uh, just relying on the classroom may not cut it, uh, right? We need to do more uh, to help people on the job, uh, right? And, and when we go into that model, um, learners as individuals, they need to start seeing value, right? It is having a direct impact on their job, right? And so analytics, the, the benchmarking, the feedback, um, you know, AI can play a pretty big role in making this process very uh, effective as well. So I think those are uh, some elements that we are tracking at Nowscape from a future of talent development perspective. Mm, no, that's that's very very. Uh, again, we're we're I think we're aligned in, in, in our thought patterns. I think the only uh, thing thing we will keep in mind is that. Um, and again, I'm very partial because I, I work for Skillsoft, and, and everything I talked about today is 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 technology or, or, or vendor agnostic. And I, I used to be a, a client, but but again, coming back to um, the constraints and concerns, many organizations. Uh, focus from the top down and they're not focusing on the learner and that experience. And if we have, we start with them and what's going to make them most productive, I think it's going to make the organization uh, more productive. And, and back to your idea of digital transformation, digital transformation that has made, again, um, the workplace safer and uh, in the name of business continuity can really not just externally change the customer experience, but internally. So technologies and platforms like we have to offer today as, as partners, I think can be very, very compelling. Yeah, so that's a reason why I'm very excited about this partnership being between Nolscape and Skillsoft because the way we organize our offering to the market is leading now and leading next. There are certain things that we need to do now, uh, right now to get better. And at the same time, we need to prepare for the future. And when I look at the Skillsoft offering, you've got um, great leadership content and great digital transformation content as well. I think. The, the match is great. Um, and uh, these are critical issues that uh, organizations are facing. And I think this partnership comes at, a, at the right time. So um, I think those were the key questions that uh, we had. Um, so any uh, parting thoughts you have, Benny, for the audience? And, and uh, from an audience perspective, I'm sure you have um, uh, plenty of questions as well. Please feel free to send us your questions on the chat window. Uh, Benny and I will be uh, happy to answer those. Uh, but Benny, sure. any parting thoughts for our audience today? Uh, yeah, two things. One is uh, globally, we've we've heard in many regions of the world this whole idea of diversity. And in our world, in learning, I think acknowledging diversity is important. There are many choices out there when you have the ability to go out and look for learning partners. But um, from our standpoint, we try to address this diversity by having different modalities for learning. And I shouldn't say modalities, but different ways of people learning, whether it be watching in terms of courses and videos. And those videos could be a three minute video prior to my first instance of giving critical feedback to an individual, just to remind me how to be effective. Uh, I can read to get the more, more detail in, in the solution that I'm, I'm trying to learn. And that reading does include in our instance, uh, an exclusive uh, redistribution of MIT Sloan management review articles, as well as full length books and, and um, book summaries. Audiobooks, uh, Audible has actually indicated that um, uh, Gen, the, 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 uh, Gen Z is actually uh, consuming more books uh, than boomers are. It's just in a different format where they're listening to more books because it's convenient yeah. when you're, when you're uh, working out or when you're in your car and so on. And lastly, this practice, the idea of practicing to synthesize the learning and to really have it be effective is, is just this, the idea of having practice assets. I think we've, we've covered those things. And again, you might have to go through many partners to do this, but, but Skillsoft is, is going to be one in, 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 you know, in partnership with uh, Nullscape. And the last thing is just uh, Gartner last year did their digital dexterity um, index of countries. And uh, many had assumed it was going to be something like the United States or, or someone with you know, this, this great investment from the government like Singapore with, with, with Fiserv in that in, in, in their, uh, within their borders. But the number one, organi uh, one number one country was India, number two, the UK, and number three, the United States. Why? Because the key 
deciding criteria for Gardner what, around digital dexterity was an audience who was willing to learn digital and leadership skills. And uh, so we have a great opportunity in the region. And uh, I think that'll be my, my last thought. Absolutely, Benny. So uh, from my end, I think um, going back to the uh, challenges in the in the learning space, right? So my parting thought, thoughts would be number one, how do we make learning more intentional, right? As opposed to accidental, how do we make a learning deep instead of uh, just, just a shallow experience? And how do we uh, give a practice experience to learners so that they also have a chance to unlearn and relearn as paradigms are shifting rapidly uh, in the digital world. So I think those are the three uh, parting thoughts I have. And I'd like to conclude this by saying, you know, in today's context, machines are learning. The crucial question is, are we learning? And are we learning fast enough? Uh, that, that is essentially what I wanted to share as a, as a parting thought. But let's see if there are any questions on the chat window. Yes, yeah, so Pragati has a, a, has a wonderful observation. Organizations take a top-down approach because when training for skills, uh, the reporting manager needs to be on the same page else we create a bigger hurdle for the learner. That's, I think that's a great uh, uh, great point you've made there, uh, Pragati. Uh, Benny, any observations on this? How do you uh, bring reporting managers into the design process and how critical is that? Well, the support of that, that um the support of the manager is going to be very important because without the ability to allocate time, again, uh, Burzin has indicated that without any uh, formal allocation for, for uh, development, the learner only has uh, 21 minutes or so each week to actually allocate to learning. And so if you have something that's mission critical, would you want to leave only 21 minutes per week for that person to know something or do, to, to be able to perform better uh, without the support of that manager, again, that that uh, we have the organization goals, but from the the actual um, interface with the end, end uh, learners, the, there there has to be that support structure uh, throughout the organization for sure. Absolutely, that's been our experience as well. Um, there's a question from uh, G Gomez. Can you elaborate on talent intelligence? Uh, sure. So. Um, each one of our simulations and allscape simulations, we have a portfolio of products mapped under leading now and leading next. And there are uh, multiple competencies, about 100 plus competencies that we cover through these uh, simulation products. These are hands-on learning tools, right? Um, on the one hand, you can have knowledge acquisition, going through e-learning, uh, watching videos, and to apply that, you come to Nallscape and you get into a, a real life-like situation, a case study where you have to take a decision. You are the decision maker and different interesting experiences unfold, you take your decisions. And right at the end of this, uh, we're able to generate a report which runs into you know, 15, 20 pages that uh, lays out in thread by detail all the competencies you've demonstrated in the simulation game. This is very similar to, let's say, a pilot undergoing a, a flight simulation experience, right? So are you able to take off um, in poor lighting conditions? Uh, are you able to handle stormy weather and so on? So we need to get an understanding of how robust our talent is uh, when it comes to facing different situations. That's what the simulation is all about. So we are able to then collate all of this information, aggregate this data across multiple people. Let's say an organization does this across 1,000, 5,000 people. Imagine if you're able to pull in all of this behavioral data and show all of this in a dashboard saying, hey, this is the red, amber, green on crucial competencies uh, you have. This is uh, the impact. If you don't work on this, uh, this is what's going to happen. And what can you be doing uh, in the future, right? And there's also benchmarking that we do across organizations um, in the same industry, across uh, levels and roles and so on. That becomes extremely useful for organizations as they get into an uncharted territory, right? You're getting into this whole digital transformation. You don't know what the gold standard is, but this data really helps you figure out if you are progressing from, like I said earlier, knowing digital to uh, doing digital, to becoming, to being digital. So we are able to help organizations uh, every uh, step of the way. I'm sure uh, Skillsoft also has a pretty robust um, you know, talent analytics framework uh, in terms of usage. And you saw that video where they're getting into a neuroscience to figure out how learners are responding uh, to different uh, uh, learning experiences. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And 
and again, back back to uh, working with in, in combination with Nullscape. The the idea here is we we will be able to in partnership uh, you know, talk about the trends that we're seeing uh, and talk about the con con consumption trends and also look at uh, the uh, we have a, a large a uh, group of customer success organization that work daily with our clients in particular and see within the, the verticals, you know, what the focus is on. And, and you know, a good example is uh, we, we did a study um, that encompassed around uh, 10 industries, 78 organizations, uh, 33,000 uh, learners overall, and were able to analyze uh, what the uh, key components were in terms of the trends of their the, the utilization to inform the organizations around um, if what they believed was important was also important to the learners. And uh, hopefully there's an alignment there. Absolutely. There's one more question on uh, key training needs uh, to develop an agile organization. This comes from Anik Gupta. Uh, so agile, as you know, as a concept emerged in the software space, uh, right? There's a, a manifesto which talks about the best way to develop agile software. But in today's context, um, it, not just in software, but in pretty much every domain, uh, you see the need for agility, right? This is largely, I feel, driven by customer expectations. Uh, wherever you have a customer expectation which demands instant gratification, on-demand experience, you need the organization to respond in an agile fashion. So uh, the key training needs that we see here are, uh, it could be from a sales and support perspective, how do I respond to customer um, needs in an agile fashion. We've seen a lot of training needs uh, emerge on that front. Uh, definitely from a product management perspective, how do I develop my product portfolio in an agile fashion um, to marketing? Uh, and, and today you're dealing with multiple channels, uh, right? Be it uh, on social media or traditional uh, marketing channels, and you need to be responsive to what's happening. Um, you know, there are you know, trends and things that are going viral on a daily basis. Uh, so are you agile enough to respond to those trends, right? So those are uh, some key training needs that uh, we are tracking when it comes to agile. Benny, any thoughts on that front? Yeah, so, uh, we, we have a, a number of mindsets or competencies that make up our Skillsoft Leadership Development Program. And I indicated we, we vetted this through Wharton, but the genesis of those competencies uh, were, were actually the first 10 were based on uh, research that was done by Google. Google did a project called Oxygen. Uh, which looked at the 10 competencies that modern leaders and mindsets that modern leaders required to be very effective, whether they were new or they were mature leaders, these are the 10 that needed to be addressed. And, and uh, today, the continuity that we have since November of last year is these competencies are being, uh, the content for these competencies is being coded off by MIT Sloan. So these are things like leading through disruption, uh, leading through change, um, um, developing I innovative mindsets, uh, and, and including le leading virtually, because leadership has been for decades taught in, in a co-located environment with direct supervision. And that's very different in terms of giving feedback, acknowledging and actually coaching in a virtual way that we're presenting in right now. So um, the, the, the uh, training needs are, again, have developed the same pace that digital transformation is developing. Uh, Rajiv, I believe you're on, yes. on mute. Yes. Um, so we've reached the, uh, the time limit for that we've set for ourselves. So uh, thanks for those questions. Um, you've been a, a patient audience and lovely questions. Thanks for uh, sending that uh, our way. And thank you, Benny, for taking this uh, time. I know it's late evening, your time in Canada. Uh, thanks for taking, taking this time. And thanks for sharing your wonderful insights. Uh, I took away a lot of um, copious notes on my notebook here. Um, and it, it, you know, the way you brought in industry research, through actual conversations that you've had with, uh, with, with your customers and uh, bringing in timely insights for our audience here. I re really, really appreciate that. And once again, uh, delighted uh, uh, about this uh, partnership with uh, Skillsoft and uh, yeah, really optimistic about what we can do for the clients together. Thanks so much for having me. And uh, hopefully each of you have a good rest of your day. Thanks, Benny. Thank you, everyone. You can stay in touch.